Um, yeah, so, so like I mentioned, I'll kind of just like quickly go <laughs> through some background. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of bodies of work and that's something that like, honestly, going back through and preparing for this kind of like looking back, trying to organize and collect things and trying to highlight specific projects that sort of map a trajectory. Um, I've, I noticed that things are kind of moving and weaving in and out, um, but it really starts um, first and foremost, like with graduate school. Um, I, I did my MFA at Cranbrook Academy of Art. And that was an extremely like sort of pivotal time for me. Um, almost immediately prior to, to Cranbrook Academy of Art, I was studying painting and digital media. And believe it or not, being, you know, a, a sort of artist or creative in, in Kentucky, I really wasn't exposed to like capital G, capital D graphic design. Um, I, I really had like no, no sort of uh, awareness of it really until like the summer of my senior year in, in college. And, and, you know, as cliche as it, as it might be, um, watching the Helvetica documentary, I was like, you know, it kind of opened my eyes, you know, it was like all of a sudden the world was like unveiled to me and immediately knew that I didn't want to be a studio painter. So stopped making, you know, large 10, 10 by 15 foot paintings and really started like, um, almost obsessively, uh, working and, and playing with type. Um, and, and that led me to like to essentially pursue um, a graduate degree at Cranbrook Academy of Art, and then that that's where I was exposed um, to a lot of like the influences uh, that I sort of carry with me today. Publications and designers like Yacht Van Bennekom, Mike Mir, um, O32C, Fantastic Man, Kids Wear, a lot of these like European um, publications and magazines. Dot dot dot. Emma Gray those things sort of opened and showed me like what graphic design could be. Um, and that stuff is, is pretty pivotal. After that, I, I went to Urban Outfitters, their global headquarters in Philly and worked there for almost three years on their internal team. Um, a small team of six making work for 200 plus stores like worldwide. It was kind of like a crash course in like what it meant to be a, like a working graphic designer. Um, and I was able to take a lot of like the the sort of experiences that I got at Urban and a lot of the, like the knowledge that I was given at at Cranbrook and synth and really synthesized those things at the Aspen Art Museum where I was head of design for again like another two and a half three years prior to leaving during the height of COVID and trying to start um, the studio which was forthcoming um, and in between that gap there's this layer of experimentation and collaboration with like really key individuals, um, one being Daniel Kent. Um, he was the, the art director and creative director at Urban and, and him and I have like formed a very tight um, friendship and, and sort of bond and we're frequent collaborators on self-initiated projects and publications as well as another designer, Clint Soren. And those collaborations are what really set the foundation for um, forthcoming books which is the sort of umbrella that a lot of these projects that we'll look at at the beginning of the presentation are held under. And from forthcoming, that's transitioned into um, another partnership, um, which is something that you'll, you'll see repeated is this idea of partnership collaboration and communication over and over um, with another venture called Eminence. And that was done with a photographer based in Japan um, who shoots a lot of fashion um, editorial in Japan um, and, and worldwide. Um, there's one particular project toward the end that we'll talk about that um, wouldn't have been possible without John Clayton Lee. Um, and from Eminence, um, we're sort of, you know, here now, which is with MFG, and we'll look at um, two projects that, that have been done um, with MFG as well. So this is kind of like a, a sort of like graphic timeline that shows this kind of like overlap because the idea of collaboration and partnership and, and like an ongoing collaboration and partnership is something that's like really important um, to my practice and, and to me as a, as a maker and a creative. And from that, 
this idea of what it means to generate culture or in short producing and deploying content um almost like obsessively is something that that is also kind of core to me um my hands don't do very well when they're when they're idle i'm like constantly doing something constantly trying to make something and um part of that is really taking in like my surroundings reinterpreting it remixing it and then and then putting it back out there whether that's through the form of books pamphlets posters um collaborations on zines magazines um websites even just constantly sort of making and repurposing and distributing and remixing that content. Um, and this is something that, you know, admittedly what I was exposed to a little too late in life. You know, I, I like to try to imagine if I was 17 years old and reading Mark Fisher, I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with Mark Fisher, his writing or his work, um, I highly recommend uh, the book Ghosts of My Life and um, the, his collected blog um, called K-Punk, um, published by Zero Books, um, really sort of opened my eyes and um, gave me a sort of set of tools to kind of look at what it means to critique the culture around us, but then also what it means to, to try to sort of make culture. And this is, this is one of many, 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 many quotes that I, I could have pulled from him, but this is Mark Fisher. Essentially, he he's talking about Thatcherism and the conservative sort of push um, that was happening in Britain and what that did to visual culture um, in Britain, largely around music. And he goes on to, to say, yet perhaps because of all of this, there's an increasing sense that culture has lost the ability to grasp and articulate the present. Or it could be that in one very important sense, there is no present to grasp and articulate anymore. So a constant theme within Mark Fisher's work and then something that's resonating with me and hopefully will become sort of visible through this is this idea of taking in the present and trying to articulate it back and reflect the sentiment of that moment. Um, and this can be like, a, a personal present or at, at large, like a, a sort of like cultural critique of the present that you then interpret and translate through your work. Um, so that's something that I'm constantly trying to, to passively do um, is this idea of like reflecting the sentiment of, and it's through that reflection that I think an individual generates and creates their own voice. And like that voice is the thing that can kind of propel and carry through your work is how are you interpreting and how are you contributing to the present that then leads to a possible future? Um, so that's a, a little sort of like preface to kind of all the work, kind of like a, con a conceptual framework. Um, and again, this idea of community building. So the notion of making and distri <laughs> distribution, creating a feedback loop that then is something that a community can kind of anchor around. Um, because communities are, are built around um, experiences and those experiences can be made up of, um, you know, they're made up of culture and our sort of uh, participation and interaction with culture. So it's that feedback loop. And that's something else that's also really important, um, especially with the work that I'm doing at MFG, at MFG is this idea of building culture. Okay, so now we'll look at some images. Um, this first section, or rather the second section, is looking at um, self-initiated projects, um, the sort of very beginning of what forthcoming was, um, and then collaborations with Clint Soren, um, Daniel Kent, and then um, what forthcoming has sort of become um, after that. So this kind of takes us from the time of Cranbrook to, to urban and just into like um, my time at the Aspen Art Museum. And again, these are all self-initiated projects outside of the work that I'm doing, you know, nine to nine essentially. Um, and, and something that, that has to be mentioned um, before we kind of dive deep into this is 
Um, a few other sort of influences of mine, um, Richard Castellanitz um, and his, um, his Assembly magazine, uh, as well as Wolf Falstall, um, a sort of artist, bookmaker, designer, and then Ulysses uh, Carrion, um, who is also a sort of an artist, bookmaker, and publisher. Um, I have an arena channel that I started when I was at, at Cranbrook that sort of has been this ongoing um, collection of what I call radical publications or like radical methodologies in collecting and, dist and distributing and publishing content. Um, but I, I can name many more, but these three um, and their attitudes toward publishing distribution and, um, and work is something that, that really like resonates uh, with me. Um, particularly Wolf Falstall and his, his approach to materiality, bookmaking, Richard Costalonitz and his, his attitude of what it means to assemble and distribute. And then Ulysses with just, you know, the sort of fervor and spirit of going off and trying to start something on your own, trying to fill a vacuum, um, even though a vacuum doesn't necessarily want or need to be filled at that time. So these are just three um, primary references. And I'll kind of flip through these quickly, but all of the all of these projects were made between 2015 and and 2016. Um, and if you go to my website, there's far, far, far more images. Um, my website's fairly exhaustive, um, which is one reason why I thought about literally just auto scrolling the site and talking through. Um, that's something that is really important to me is like trying to show as much of the project as possible. Um, and, and so this was a collaboration done with Daniel Kent and we, we essentially, um, were trying to repurpose <laughs> and recycle and reuse the content that kind of surrounded us and the content that, that sort of interests us. So a lot of the writing here is is writing that I'm either reading at the time or things that that really um, matter to me. Um, I really see content um, in the same way as, as an image, as, as material that can be molded and shaped and combined with something else. Um, someone previously mentioned um, ceramics and like their interest in ceramics. Um, ironically, I hated ceramics in, in college and yet so much of my practice can be sort of taken back to this metaphor of like a, a, a sort of mound of clay being shaped and molded, whether it's an image or text, for me, they can be treated in the same way. And this, this notion of proximity and the way that you organize the image and the text together is what can either create friction or create sort of an extra layer of meaning. And that's something that I'm constantly trying to do, this notion of juxtaposition and periphery. Um, so these are examples of that, um, taking, taking existing, um, content and, um, and then photographs and or textures that, that I find and combining them to sort of create new meaning. So these are very early examples of like that, that sort of publishing practice. And these things were done in, in very limited runs and, and honestly, often distributed just to close friends or at smaller pop-up book fairs, um, and this is an, another project that collected an ongoing um, series of photographs in which I take of textures or materials or moments found on the sidewalk or within um, the sort of the periphery of like primary destination. So going from, from home to work, um, these, these projects were made um, while I was living in Philly. So my commute from home, home to Urban Outfitters uh, required four modes of transportation. And so I had to shift between four modes of transportation to get from West Philly to South Philly. And almost every morning it became ritualistic to where I would, I would sort of keep, keep my eye out and capture these moments, um, with, with the camera, um, and looking back, layering and juxtaposing and trying to find meaning and creating essentially, essentially a visual language, um, that has propelled, I think, through through my work till this day. This this is 
essentially the same sort of method, but rather being done with, with Daniel Kent, this was done with um, another friend and designer, Clint Soren. And the thing that's, that's different about this project is we, we set up a studio and instead of, ex instead of experiencing that environment um, naturally, like through the commute, we sort of took over a photo studio and brought, brought that environment into the photo studio. Um, as well as making sculptures uh, that reflected that, that same sentiment, this idea of, of textured material, the things that surround us, like using that as a palette of raw material to be reconstructed and reconfigured and then redistributed in a new way. Um, so what you see is a, essentially a linoleum tile um, that's screen printed and then a series of booklets are bound to that with a, with a red rubber band. Um, so you can see here the collection of books being stacked and bound. Um, I don't think this image has ever been uh, shown publicly, actually, but this is a series of sculptures that were props in, in the photo studio that then were uh, like further abstracted and taken apart to be used and, and essentially turned into um, the zines. Um, and a series of these sculptures were made, you know, some being the size like four, four by six inches to to six by 18 inches tall and repurposing sort of found in industrial materials. So collecting um, aggregate and rock, um, linoleum tile, things that were found around Philly, and then putting those together using um, extremely like synthetic and artificial sort of uh, um, industrial materials and binders. And these became props that were then reinterpreted through, um, through the publication. And that's something else that, that sort of carries through my work is the idea of having source material and that source material being broken down um, over and over and over and over and over, almost to the point of, of not even being related to the original image anymore, but a constant sort of material and content um, system that's, that's, that's constantly moving and further abstracting. And the more abstraction that occurs, the further it gets away from its actual like source material. Um, some other projects, these being a series of pamphlets and other artist books, one of which kind of continues the same theme of repurposing, um, uh, photography, as well as like uh, books, layouts scanned in from books that, you know, content is removed or scraped from, and then layered with like raw texture. And then this publication that, um, that takes the same idea of, of mashing my sort of personal experience through photography and developing a sense of texture with uh, very direct um, references and things that I'm looking at at that time. And this being um, photo books by Jurgen Teller, as well as fashion magazines like Kids Wear and O32C that I had mentioned before. So a lot of these projects become um, foundations or like testing grounds for, for my references and, and me to kind of collide together and synthesize and to try to make something new. Some, some photography showing the sort of like physical nature of the books. And then the other thing that I sort of want to sort of stress is this idea that just because it's not a set of bound, um, bound pages doesn't necessarily mean it can't be a quote unquote publication or something that's serial or something that, that can be read. Um, Cause that's the other, that's a, another thing that we'll look at um, and talk about briefly when we get to the assembling um, project is this idea of reading images um, rather than just looking at them. Um, that's something that is also like constantly in the back of my head. Like how, how does one make an image that, that is read? Um, and a big part of that I think is this like, idea of complexity or layering, um, something that needs to be taken apart. And this is something that's foundational in painting, right? You don't make artwork that's that's meant to just be looked at. 
it's something to be set with and something to be understood and, and taken apart. So whenever I'm, I'm making posters um, or publications or something that's, that's heavily image-based, how does one make it to where the image is read, right? Rather than something that's immediately looked at and sort of flipped through, trying to make something that compels the viewer um, to want to sit with it and try to understand it or probe a sense of curiosity. So the notion of going from publication to poster and yet the way that you engage with that doesn't change is something that I'm constantly trying to do. Um, and then this being like one of those major projects. And so assembly is an ongoing um, book project. Um, we're on uh, the fifth book now. Um, and they're small, they're, it's a small paperback that is always 160 pages long and it's always full blue photography, black and white. And it really sort of plays with the idea of um, a format of a book that's typically meant to be read um, during transit very casually, but then filling that with, with photography. Um, creating a sort of inventory of images rather than um, a set of words that can then be um, read. So the first two, um, again, frequent names that will keep coming up, Clint Soren um, and, and me, as well as Joel Evie, um, another very, very close friend, um, and then Daniel Kent. And if you go to, if you go into my website, you'll be able to see a swath of, of spreads. Um, of these publications and and really it's it's about trying to make that argument um, of that images can be read in the same way that a text could in order to sort of tell a story. So pacing and the organization of imagery um, really becomes uh, the sort of defining characteristic of this. Um, and then outside of that, the very templated and very standardized cover and form um, can oftentimes be sort of manipulated or layered onto um, when necessary to sort of reflect um, the designer or the contributor's sort of attitude toward images. Um, something that you can see um, here with Joel's um, sort of cover and then um, Daniel Kent, whose practice involves oftentimes like a lot of physical um, hand manipulation of, of design, of sort of visual elements. Um, Every, every six, 16th page is then collapsed and stretched onto the spine here. So the series started off somewhat very standard. And then, you know, something that I'm, I'm trying to work on is this idea of patience and restraint. But, you know, in a fight for boredom, we start, you know, st I start playing with my own templates and start breaking my own systems for like the sake of interest. Okay, cool. Um, so that's the kind of first section. I'm going to, I'm going to pick up the pace and try to shift through this, but the third is really about my collaborations and interactions with, with sound and music, starting with um, a poster for a club night in Philly called Making Time to a few records um, for a Swedish uh, producer named Velve. And then, um, two ongoing projects that are happening now, uh, LimeWire.Zone and then Terminal.Fail, which is um, my own sort of music outlet. Skip through. But I think before we look at a series of posters, it's really important to kind of step back and, and again, kind of look at references and, and look at influences and, and what it means to sort of combine these things. Um, and what it means to make a poster for a club night in 2020, 2021, and 2022. So something that I'm constantly also um, sort of doing and floating in my head is this idea of the relevancy of, of Swiss modernism today and what it means to take the, the principles and the ideas and the philosophy behind that work and, and reinterpret it today. Um, and, the, and, the, and honestly, the value of it today as well as looking at the sort of culture of, of, of scenes and subcultures and, and influences like immigrate, right? How, do, how does all of this stuff sort of come together? 
um, the notion of, of modernism coming out and being a reaction to the sort of chaos that was um, the leftover remnants and of World War II to you know, 90s rave culture being about um, communities reacting to um, the socio-political environment that, that the music was made in. And then my own sort of visual references and, and sort of visual heritage. Um, and all of those things sort of combining into, and the Making Time posters being a constant sort of project of, of playing with those things. Um, making Time was very much a, a playing ground for me to, um, to experiment with and like to sort of push my own visual language. Um, prior to, to my engagement, there was another, another graphic designer that made um, extremely uh, influential in the worst, not the worst way, but um, very prolific, I should say that, posters, um, David Rudnick. And David Rudnick left the project. And um, I sort of met Dave P, who was the producer and the DJ that, that put on this night and started making the posters. Again, this is, this is based in Philly. And in some ways, this is a very much a reaction to the expectation of what a visual culture around a certain type of music should look like. Um, you know, there was a sense of like hyper pop, hyper color. Um, and that's something I wanted to react against and, and sort of reinterpret in my own way. So you can see a series of, of these posters. And this is just a very like kind of small glimpse of, of the posters that were that were made. And something that I'm, I'm constantly doing is, again, using this as an opportunity to sort of experiment and react to the content that I'm kind of given. And um, really, the content's very minimal. Um, there's not much that, that needs to be communicated other than um, who's playing, a time, and, and where that is. And other than that, it's, it's really open to extreme wide interpretation. And it becomes like a, a formal sort of playing ground for me to, to sort of continue to experiment and express um, and sort of hone in to my own sort of visual language. And oftentimes like the posters are done um, in tandem or, or in a series. So you can see these two sort of responding um, to the sort of same system because of the proximity um, to like the club night, right? So the, they're, they're sort of tied together versus a poster here that is, you know, somewhat different, but still maintaining and staying within a system um, because that's something that I'm constantly also trying to do is not necessarily have or work within a set brand guideline, you know, like use these typefaces this way with these logos, rather than like, how does one create a sense of mood and feeling? And then that mood and feeling is the thing that's constant through, through the ongoing project. So hopefully that's something that, that is, is seen and sort of resonates through these posters, that there is a sense of um, continuity in a sort of building one to another, but it doesn't necessarily feel like um, there's a, a rubric that's being responded to, you know, that it has to be this thing um, at this size in this place. Cool. So, so after making time, I left Philly and um, my sort of relationship to, to the making time posters started to kind of dwindle just due to geographic proximity. Um, as well as other responsibilities. But on the tail end of that is when um, I met Velve. And a lot of these things happen, you know, in, in such a such a strange way these days with Instagram DMs and you create these longer sort of deeper relationships and collaborations. And it started with um, producing and helping him um, wrap his head around like what it means to make artwork for for two two releases. Um, this being the second, and a lot of this work is, is happening and responding to um, back and forth conversations, trying to probe 
like what are the things that that stick out to him i'm constantly trying to re like respond to and translate um content and ideas visually um and to like sort of evoke a sense of of emotion and a lot of that is is what's happening here um responding to a sense of like um culture and and history and heritage you know within sweden but then also trying to reinterpret and bend the expectation of what it means to make visuals for techno music again responding to a visual a pre-existing visual culture that's like hyper pop hyper colorful um and in some ways like nostalgic um so so trying to make make something new and and different that contributes like an extra layer of meaning to the music to to the sound and and this being the, like the first the first record and something that um that pushes that pushed this that that took place in um an unaired unpublished music video and in more cases than the actual album art um was this chair that that Vel had found on the side of the road um that that he really just like gravitated toward and eventually we um we made a an eight minute long music video uh that was never released um never distributed of of him taking this chair throughout stockholm sweden across multiple modes of, of transportation into parks um and in, into sort of places of business so a, a sort of day you know, with with this chair, that was like a major point of sort of interest and and uh, in some ways, like one could say even like inspiration to him. Um, the chair, the chair is sort of seen here, or at least fragments of it seen here and here. But you know, it, it sounds somewhat ridiculous when when you sort of put it into words. But like in the moment of making all of these things, sort of made made sense in the conversation. And it's taking a, a sort of interaction like that and then transforming it and translating it and shifting it through like multiple contexts to, to sort of make something physical, right? Um, okay, this is pretty good on time. So this, this is something that's been more recent and, and it's limewire.zone. Um, this is something that I do with uh, John John Lyman Balath and Jake Reedy. Um, they're two they're two other designers and creative directors um, here here in Utah, and it's a music night that we do um, biweekly um, out of our warehouse at MFG. And this again was born out of this idea of trying to fill a vacuum and trying to just do something um, because we wanted to and being resourceful and, and trying to make it happen. So, so LimeWire, um, its name being a direct reference to the pirating and P2P peer-to-peer software LimeWire um, is a club night that happens bi-weekly in which we have a guest slot and a warm-up slot as well as, as um, us three playing music. And it's again something to try to to anchor around and, and become like the center for a a music culture in Provo, which um, I'm not quite sure how familiar people are with Utah, but Utah can be hyper conservative in in um, a lot of ways and very sort of closed down um, and not necessarily always open to or having platforms for things like um, industrial. <laughs> techno, harsh noise, um, and even, you know, house, house music, right? It's, um, <laughs> so this was our attempt to sort of create something and um, to try to build a community around, around the sounds that, that we found interesting and the things that, um, that, you know, that we wanted to see happen in our community. Um, so as well as being like an, um, an in-person IRL event. It also happens in streams online. So every every session is live streamed and then archived and um, and then distributed um, via via YouTube. And that's something that we hope to to spend a lot of time this year, kind of opening up. We have a lot of big plans of 
trying to sort of take take the border of Utah and and really collapse it and try to sort of flex on and take advantage of our extended networks like you know music producers in Europe um, and Africa and and trying to expose you know the community to new voices and and new new sounds and new experiences and something that is is really important and all of these like amazing and beautiful photographs are taken by uh lily balleth um is again documenting and, and trying to capture the moment and then distributing that moment and and sharing that so it's you know, this is this is like a major a major sort of undertaking, and and that's something that we didn't quite understand. You know, kind of like what we were doing. I think a lot of things are are started by um, you know naive people, and I, I think that's somewhat of like a necessary component of just like getting down and just starting to do something and not being afraid of just doing doing it and trying to make it happen and leaning on and and working with you know other people. To, to sort of support that idea. Because if there's anything else that I've learned between LimeWire and MFG and a lot of the projects that we've been doing is that the if you build it, they will come mentality still exists, despite what Instagram might tell you, um, you know, posting something, trying to build an audience on, on digital platforms is that there's still a fervor and there's still a sort of energy for um, community and connection. And just being able to sort of build something, um, you know, that is, that's very concentrated that people can kind of come around and, and they can really rally and, and collect around. But part of the challenge with, with that is, and with any, any sort of community is, um, you know, does one build boundaries? What does it mean to have a music night? What is the perspective? And that's like, that's the beautiful thing about working with, um, with individuals is that you you can find moments where um, house music and harsh noise can really overlap and that people can experience um, something like like techno and house and then at the same time understand appreciate and enjoy um, harsh noise or or industrial so these are just like photos that that sort of document um, the different sessions that that we've done and we're on session nine we've had people from out of state at this point um we've had local people come and play um we have a mini ramp in the space and and people just come in and they they just are there to kind of enjoy the sound enjoy the music um and and sort of meet people and it it's starting to form like you know again a very small but a very tight community of individuals that that are are there every every other week um again whether or not it's it's house techno or or noise which has been you know again really inspiring and and refreshing to, to sort of see um and these are posters that that I've made for for that event um so as well as like playing music in it um I'm sort of my responsibility within it is sort of making the posters and um, sort of making the kind of visual identity for for LimeWire. And this is, is very much, um, as you can see kind of up here, uh, a play on and a riff off of like my own work that I was doing for making time. Um, this being called called making lime or making LimeWire. So this idea of like continuing like that sort of practice and that methodology, but for a new context, um, which, you know, something oftentimes like as designers can, can be seen as like, not necessarily a good thing, right? Like every client needs to have like a sort of like a new interpretation or they need to, to stick out or they need to be um, uniquely identifiable in one way. But what does it mean to sort of like, to sh take something that that's existed for one and then repurpose and like reinterpret and shift that into like a sort of new context and and kind of build on it and further sort of like uh, push that that methodology. So these are the um, posters that I've been doing doing for that. And then actually we're, we're going to skip over 
some of this music stuff to get in to the, the commission projects. The first being um, archival studies. And this is, this is my longest um, engaged quote unquote professional commission project. Um, archival studies is an architecture studio based in Copenhagen. And um, I've been, I've been sort of in charge with um, pretty much anything that's, that's visual um, that has like image and text sort of coming together. So really creating and, and helping them um, from a graphic design standpoint. Um, there, there are two people that I met at Cranbrook. Uh, they were studying architecture while I was studying graphic design and they've gone on to, to create um, a, a small but somewhat successful and prolific practice in Copenhagen. Um, and a lot of like what I'm constantly trying to do is Inter like reinterpret their practice into these contexts. So this is um, some photos of their website. And you can see that this is the grid view um, of their projects page, as well as the sort of list view. And that's something that is that was really important to them is like this idea of organ organizing data, information and content, as well as expressing those things visually. And in turn, like really being transparent about the process that is behind um, their projects. So this being um, Gasoline Grill was a restaurant remodel that they did. And all on the project pages, um, the left side is always housing um, a gallery of finished photography and documentation, while the right gallery um, shows sort of behind the scenes and in process making. So you see these two things in tandem, a very raw and very polished, which then further reflects like their sentiment and ideas around um, architecture and building this notion of um, being, being true to structure, but then also having um, extremely polished and high-end and elevated materials. A glimpse of, of their identity. So the back of, this, of the stationary, always showing um, images of the work while the front of the stationery always um, showing the sort of content of the message. And then this is a, a smaller project that we did. It was a pop-up in a um, studio slash uh, store in, in Copenhagen called Studio X. Um, they did a series of uh, furniture, their, um, their furniture studies in this magenta linseed stain. And we wanted to capture that color through the printed materials. So the printed materials were done through um, a gradient um, of, of two, two colors going from like a bright fluorescent pink into a magenta. And then that was carried to, um, to the, the storefront as well. So glimpses at looking at how, how an A, um, this being an A, an A3 sheet can be sort of manipulated and folded as well as their portfolio, um, a collection of portfolios. Cool. And then go and archive. Um, this is one project that I was doing with John Clayton Lee. Um, it is a response to vintage Japanese fashion and culture. And you can grab, you can grab whatever you need. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I hijacked our, our living room. <laughs> it was like, there was like a nervous dance for a second. I was like, you, you can do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so go go and archive um, is a vintage is an online reseller of vintage uh, Japanese garments. So, um, this is this is something that's like quite interesting to me. Um, when I got to know John Clayton Lee um, through a mutual friend Joel Evie, um, he was based in Japan, and something that he noticed is a lot of these these vintage garments that um, people covet. Are, are really sold extremely cheaply and in like mass quantity in Japan. But the, the price premium really comes from like the access to these products. And that's something that we wanted to break down with Goen. 
um, you know, a lot of the items that we ha that we have on the store are things that are being sold for two to three times as much money as we have them listed on other online retailers that that really buy a Shopify um, template and just drop in images without necessarily um, trying to sort of honor or acknowledge the sort of visual culture or the culture that these garments were made in. And that's something that we, for going to be successful, like it, it needed to, to capture that and needed to reflect and, and sort of pay homage to the visual culture um, and the cultures in which these, these garments were made. So here you can see um, a swath of, of materials from um, Yuji to Isimiyaki and, and Kom de Grosson. And a lot of this visual language is what we used to, um, to act as a foundation and something to respond to for Go and Archive. But, you know, printed, printed material aside, um, you know, these being postcards that were that were taken around and distributed around um, Tokyo, to posters that were that were also printed and hung in Japan. Going is really for, first and foremost, um, first and foremost, a website, and I highly encourage um, everyone uh, to go to it and and really take it in, but. Again, what does it mean to make a shop that that tries to sort of build and respond to the culture around the product? So all the photography um, done on the printed materials and the posters are like original photographs um, by um, by John Clayton Lee, and and you know without without him and his his own sort of like artistic eye for for photography and his own. Um, sort of admiration for the product and the, and the culture and the history, like this, this project wouldn't have been possible, but very much like wanted to, to, to show how the visual culture can be used and it can be reinterpreted and not, not be a sort of layer of pastiche. Um, so, you know, this being the home, some, some snippets of the homepage, um, often on the homepage and you know, we change it less often than we should, probably three to four times a year. Um, we try to sort of expose people to to that culture. So, you know, here this being um, the CD that was um, used during a Comme des Garcons like runway show. So, linking out and and trying to expose people to this content, to this culture, <clears throat> as well as um, again displaying photographs and this this was a, an opportunity for us to like to think about like what would it mean to to make like the ideal um the ideal reseller for for sort of Japanese vintage fashion um so again this is this is John really reinterpreting um what it means to shoot lay flat and an editorial image that can be used in a grid or on on individual product pages um, this, this is something that, you know, is one of, it's, it's one of the projects that I sort of work on the least again, like we update this four times a year, but it's something that we're constantly thinking about and, and extremely passionate about. So, um, if you guys know any investors that are, that are looking <laughs> and want to, want to, uh, give some money, please let us know. But, um, again, this is like, our response to sort of building the culture that we want to see around these things rather than just a white page with a grid of photos and extremely high prices. Like what does it mean to create something that is more authentic, that's more honest and more sincere and in some ways like more inspired. So, so, so go and archive is our attempt at that. Cool. Um, this is the last section. Um, we're almost there. Sorry, everyone, uh, if it's if it's been going <laughs> long, but um, MFG has been around for um, six years. Um, I've been there for two years now, and um, I was sort of, you know, I was brought in to to kind of take over the design studio um, and help sort of push it and 
and the last two years has been like a sort of whirlwind. It, it feels like it's been um, closer to 10 years. And one of like one of the major initiatives that that we tried to to get off the ground and or that, that had been tried to get off the ground before that something that once we built a team, we were really able to execute was MFG is like physical retail space as well as its digital, its digital store. And um, MFG store again is a is a sort of a point, a intersection point of products experiences um, ranging from apparel to accessories to magazines, and trying to sort of build and expose people to culture. Um, so a big aspect of it is trying to make products and curate uh, magazines and publications that people in Utah um, otherwise might might not sort of know anything about. Um, and in some ways, MFG store is like a, a, a sort of attempt to fill my own selfish need of being an avid magazine collector. Um, so having lived on the East Coast and having extreme and immediate access to um, some of the best like bodegas and boutiques um, for publications and magazines in the world to going to Colorado, living in the middle of the mountains, um, up to my neck in snow with no culture within 200, you know, a 200 mile radius outside of the Aspen Art Museum to then coming to a city um, like Salt Lake, but then still having that, that vacuum that needed to be filled. And MFG store was like our attempt to fill that and to sort of build on that. And, and not just from a digital like website e-commerce experience, but an IRL physical, um, physical space. So a, a big thing, a big role that I play within the store is like, it's curating and, and running the magazine portion of the store. Uh, it's something that I could talk for another like eight hours about like the history <laughs> of publications and magazines and, and fashion, but it's like, it's a deep interest to me and the value of, of printed matter as especially like now with the pace of like, of the internet and visual culture sort of speeding up um, so quickly to it's almost slowing down. And it's this idea of the slow cancellation of the future is happening like on the internet. But within these these like physical um, printed art, like these printed artifacts, there's culture that otherwise you, you're not going to be exposed to. Um, and I think Numero Berlin and Numero Home Berlin um, which is published by Off Our Rocker Publishers. If, if you're not familiar with this magazine, I think um, really embodies that that idea more than any other publication that's that's being made now is um, a container of culture that otherwise cannot be experienced unless you experience it through this this physical entity. Um, that publication's over 600 pages each issue. And it's things that you're not going to, to sort of be able to see um, otherwise. And that was a real important sort of driving point for the store having a physical location is a place to, to sort of come and, and take in, you know, cultures from outside of Utah. Almost all of our magazines are coming um, from outside of, outside of the U.S., um, whether it's Europe or Japan. But aside from the magazines, um, we also produce apparel, um, and the apparel is another point of collaboration. So these two teas are um, from season one of our community editions, which is a platform for us to collaborate with designers and artists to, to make and, and distribute um, t-shirts and apparel. Each, each interaction and each um, collaboration is, like an, is an attempt to not just make another cool looking tea, but for them to like sort of reinterpret and reflect on their practice as a designer. So Colin Deufler, this was like a new venture um, for him at the time, um, for better or worse. And this was like an excuse and a context for him to remix and to, to sort of look back at um, his notebook and look back at his sketches and to kind of, you know, really publish them on, on a different platform, as well as uh, Virgil Flores, um, a really amazing designer. This t-shirt, um, can't quite see it from this image, 
but was an, a sort of means for him to reinterpret his practice. So he collected snippets of the projects that he did that year. So pulling textures, pulling out iconography um, and symbols, and then remixing them onto the shirt. Um, and both of these are, are available on the, on the store website. As well as MFG like making their own apparel. Um, and uh, again, looking at apparel and accessories as a means of just trying to push that thing and to say something different um, that's not really being said, um, especially within the local community. So trying to create and expose uh, people to new visual cultures. Um, this, I just wanted to sort of touch on this because we're, we're about to launch um, the second um, Ellipsis annual lecture series that will also take place in June. Um, and this is, again, a a point for community building, for connecting individuals and exposing people to, to different ideas. So the idea of Ellipsis is to, um, to engage with and, and talk to designers, makers, and artists that are otherwise behind the scenes of somewhat large things or, you know, very interesting things that maybe aren't quite as big as they should be yet. So OEM, um, Joel Evie, who, um, who at the time during his lecture talked about um, what it meant to sort of build and reinterpret Grailed. He's the, um, the creative director at Grailed currently, as well as Christian Henson, um, a somewhat low-key graphic designer doing extremely amazing and inspiring work out of Manila. So Ellipsis is MFG's attempt to kind of collect these voices and distribute the things that they have to say. Um, and we're starting again, like the second year, um, really excited about, about that. This is something that the entire studio really rallies around. And then some snippets and photos from our, uh, our grand opening of like the physical space. Um, this being the sort of like backspace of the store where we have a mini ramp and where LimeWire takes place. Um, we had live screen printing there. Um, it was really cool to kind of, to see people come out and really rally around and, and connect. We had local, um, local businesses do pop-ups within our store as well. And then <laughs> the last project I swear, Standard Edition um, is a new endeavor for MFG in which we're opening up access in like an unprecedented way for individuals and studios and companies to manufacture high quality custom apparel and goods. Um, so this is a platform for us to, um, to really try to, to open up and increase like the quality and the access to quality manufacturing for people who otherwise might be intimidated or not know how to access these things. Um, and the whole idea is, is anchored around this, this notion of self-expression, whether you're an individual, a studio, or a company, um, giving you access to the platform um, to better express yourself through custom apparel. Um, and this is a project that MFG has been working on for the last um, two years, pretty much since, since I, was, I was brought on day one. And it's, it's finally starting, starting to sort of launch. Um, and looking at like what it means to sort of build a brand around a process um, that is somewhat um, obfuscated through like technicality and through, you know, the, the difficulty of actually communicating with factories um, in China in a different time zone through a different language. And we're hoping standard edition can kind of break that apart and break that down for people. And we're doing that through, you know, fully custom, um, apparel that's built from the ground up, cut and sew from the ground up and, and really honed in on um, taking from the, the six plus years of experience that MFG as a collective has and distilling that down into a platform for people to sort of use um, to be able to express themselves. So this is just some, um, some of the e-com sort of lay flats of 
the boxy tee in our boxy hoodie, as well as um, on, on model photography. And with each initiative and each endeavor we do, you know, this is a, it's an excuse for us to sort of express our own methodology for branding and for identity. So despite it being an internal project, it's, it's very much treated like, like a client one, right? It, it's taken very seriously um, with like the utmost degree of like respect to whatever the task is to be done. So these are just some examples of, of photography as well as like <laughs> first editorial um, sort of campaign shoot. Um, this being done um, uh, several months ago. Um, this, this stuff will all start to trickle out and leak out um, as we like go to launch standard edition in the next, in the next few months publicly. Um, it's sort of soft launch behind a sort of like a, a communication wall, but, uh, but yeah, so, so, you know, standard edition being a sort of real test case of like what it means to build a brand, create content and express that content um, for ourselves. Yeah, so that's it. <laughs> wow, that's yeah, a huge body of work. Yeah.